We're glad that you've joined us this Sunday morning. Welcome. Look at things. If you all are here, some of you might have been a little bit nervous about the eclipse. Guess what? We made it. Psalm 57, 5 says, Be exalted above the heavens, O God. Let your glory be above all the earth. Amen. You know, what's really interesting is that in the eclipse, there's a phenomenon it's called the ring. The other thing is that they don't know how that happens, but the, uh, the, 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 the shoots of energy and the ray that create the ring that we saw is hotter than the sun. It's very interesting to stop and think about that because Jesus says in his word, greater things you will do in my name. Well, how is that possible if he's God? You see, when we work with God, it's not that God's being eclipsed. It's just that his energy flows through us and it's going to get hotter as the Holy Spirit works through us. Right. And he reminded us this, even in the heavens, as they declare his mercy, his grace, and his power. So if you're here today and you were freaked out, you should have given your money to the church. We would have been just happy with that. No, just kidding. <laughs> and if you're still alive after the eclipse, you got you got to know something. We've got some work to do. You got to go tell some people there's still time to come to Jesus and to walk in obedience. Erica's baptism showed us that this morning, isn't that right? I just want to take a little time. Some of y'all know that before I was a pastor, I was a vice president of a communication company, and I lived in South Texas for almost a year. Some of my friends are in harm's way this morning. Things are tough. Texas is being battered. Let's pray. Father, we just pray, not only because this is the great state of Texas, amen on that, but we pray for all those people. Lord, please protect them and be over them and help them. It's Sunday morning and some people couldn't go to church because the church, their building was destroyed. Be with my friends that are out there. Protect and guide them, Father God. And Father, I pray that in this recovery, because we will recover, that your name will be proclaimed and glorified. And that all the ignorance and stupidity that you go to this church and that church, that be dissolved. And that we be united in Christ through this. Father, we thank you for what you're going to do. But protect them, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now, I, uh, that wasn't part of the sermon. It's just that it just so happened that that's what happened. And so our affiliation through the Baptist Convention, if you all want to give a donation, uh, they, they have a great response team. They work with the Red Cross, and they're going out this morning, right now. And so if you want to donate something, just put there in the offering and put, uh, uh, you know, disaster or whatever. Anything helps, and we'll get that to them tonight. We'll get that money to them tonight, I can assure you that. And next week I'll tell you how much we were able to collect for that. You're going to need our help. You're going to need your prayer. We all do that? All right. Now, if this is your first time here with us, we want you to know that our hope as a church, as a team, is that you don't get sidetracked by all of this stuff. Our prayer is that you feel that you've come to a place where you can experience and connect with the Holy God. So don't worry, we're not going to ask you to stand or anything like that. We're just super glad that you're here. Today is the second to our last of the messages that we've been in, Paracletos, in the series. Just one more after this. We've been in this series for, check that out, 22 weeks. So you may be asking, well, what does Paracletos mean? It means the one that comes alongside. He's the called one. That's the Greek word for the meaning of the Holy Spirit. Last Sunday, we dove into the gift of the Spirit, the, specifically the gifts of revelation. That is, gifts that deal with revelation that the Holy Spirit gives and uses in and through us. To reveal to us, and more specifically to others about Christ, today, we'll see gifts of power. We're going to get into miracles. We're going to get into the strength and the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, last Sunday, I showed you all the video 
of all those gifts, not only how they look, but how they work, and how if God gives us that type of a gift, gives revelation, what our responsibility is. I was asked recently, do I believe in those gifts of revelation? Listen to me, I certainly do. Gifts that include the gift of prophecy, and the reason I believe I was asked is because when I started the series, I say that our modern day prophet is the word of God. And we who have prophecy, who have that gift, the gifts of revelation, we're to use the very word of God to make sure that we're walking in life. Now, even if we have the gift of prophecy or our prophets, we are responsible in our gifts. Paul says to the Corinthians and to us, the prophet checks with the prophet. That's what we're supposed to do. That is, we who have the gifts of revelation, we are to go back to the word of God. Now, if you weren't here, the video that I showed was of a documentary that showed a missionary, a Christian missionary. He was in an uh, area of Buddhism and Hinduism. The Lord told this missionary, he was told by God that God had revealed to him to go find this guru. He was dressed in an orange gown and he had a white beard. Now, for some of us, that might have been a stretch. It might have been a, maybe a good guess on this dude's part, but when they go and they find this guy, the guru lets the missionary speak to him, this Christian missionary, because you see, Christ had already spoken to that guru about finding this missionary. And then in finding that missionary, this missionary is going to speak to him about the true God, Christ. And the end result is really the big deal here. This guru starts and continues to follow Jesus Christ. That's how the gift of revelations work. You see, listen to me. More than the gift that we get, that we have, more than do I believe or not believe that video and what we saw is this. Listen to me. As the Holy Spirit speaks to you even this morning and gives you a gift or gifts, the opportunity for you is to share Christ. That's what's the most important in your gift then we are the ones then, right, that we must show. Listen up. We are the ones that can choose to or not to be used by the Spirit. That's on us. But let me remind you that if you're saved this morning, if you call yourself a Christian, you see, listen to me, this is very important. Using your gift is not a suggestion anymore. That is what Peter tells us that we are to do. He says we are to employ, that is, exercise the gifts of the Spirit. And so if you missed that message, you can go to our YouTube channel, Mesa Place Church, El Paso, for that one or any ones that you might have missed. Today's message, like I said, is gifts of power. This deals with primarily three areas in Scripture that I like to touch on just quickly. The reason why I'm going to just touch on these is because the gifts of power are innumerable. Dude, Jesus changed water into wine. Power. He raised people to life. That's power. So I'm just going to touch on three, categorize them. So the first gift that we're going to see in your outline are the gifts of faith. Faith is a power. Did you know that? The first one there in your outline are gifts of faith. And like I said, I'll just touch on this. Because this one point I'm going to come back to and will be the main point on gifts of power this Sunday morning. So what do I mean by the gifts of faith? You see, listen to me very carefully. It all starts with faith. Our life in eternity, our decisions and our ability to believe. So by gifts of faith, those are gifts that deal with believing in God for the spiritual, for the supernatural. That is trusting and not doubting in what we believe as we learn and lean on the word of God. That's why we've got to go back to the Word of God. I don't mean faith as a term of your salvation. I think sometimes we're so misunderstood, right? Because you have to have a lot of faith to trust in Jesus Christ. Isn't that right? But listen to me. How much faith did Jesus Christ have to have to die on the cross for you? Don't be so selfish. Like, I look at me. How much faith? I'm a Christian. Camarito. Camarito. Calm down. I'm not talking about that. Now, what is cool about trusting and believing is that the Holy Spirit, even in 
trusting and believing. Even in just in that one process, the Holy Spirit helps us even in that. You see, as we ask the Spirit to help us to trust and believe, look with me at Mark chapter 9, verse 24 this morning. And if you don't have your Bible, go ahead and raise your hand. One of the ushers will get one to you. If you have a smart device, go ahead and load it up. Just don't get on all that social media. Hello, you know, is it something else? But let's go to Mark chapter 9, verse 24. It's the second book in the New Testament. Some of you scholars are going, I have Matthew, Mark, see, back up. Mark. Mark chapter 9, verse 24. Look how the Holy Spirit even helps us in this. It says, immediately the boy's father cried out and said, I do believe, help my unbelief. Isn't that cool? Now, this is a man whose child needed help from Jesus. But what I want you to notice this morning is that this man knew, right? He, he, he was able to look within his own ability in what he needed, and he wasn't sufficient enough for that miracle. But see there, he knew who did. Help my unbelief, Lord. Two things that Christ does in this. He heals this boy, but he also gives strength to this unbelief of this man. Heck, Jesus Christ, he, he tells us both in Luke and in Matthew, right? And we already heard Angela say that, but Jesus tells us how much faith do we need? It's the size of a mustard seed. It's that small. Now, you got to ask yourself, why would Jesus say that? Because listen to me. The faith that we need isn't in our ability or power. That's just to start off with. It, it's understanding that it is in who or what our faith is in. Now, you know, you know who had this kind of faith in the scripture in the Bible? Actually starts off as a non-believer. It's this soldier, he's known as the centurion. A centurion just means he had a hundred men underneath his command. And in Matthew chapter 8, verse 5 to 13, you can find that account. You don't have to go there. But this centurion, he has this servant. He has a servant. Now you can tell that this centurion, he, he deeply cared for his people underneath him. He, he wasn't your usual kind of soldier or dude. And, and so he goes to Jesus to heal his servant. Now Jesus sees this and he's moved and he says, well, let, let, let's go to your house, man. If he was here in the thousand, he'd say, let's go to your shanty. But anyway, and the centurion, he says, I'm not worthy for you to come to my house. And then he says this, look with me at, at Matthew chapter 8, verse 8. It says, but the centurion said, Lord, I am not worthy for you to come under my roof. But just say the word. Just say the word. My servant's going to be healed. And, and we'll come back to this point. So first are the gifts of faith that we'll see. Second is, in, in the gifts of power, the gifts of healing. Some of you here need a healing. Some of you needed faith. Let's look at gifts of healing. See, these deal with God performing healings supernaturally. And, and letting us be a part of that if that's the gift he's giving us. There's many, many examples of this in Scripture. The disciples, for instance, in Matthew chapter 10, verse 1, Jesus sends out the twelve, and he gives them authority over and to cast out unclean spirits. He gives them the, the power to heal every kind of disease and sickness. There's another example of Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 17. He heals the widow's boy. In 2 Kings 4, he also heals another young man. So gifts of healing we'll look at. And third point of gifts of power, it's working in miracles. It's the very ability to work in miracles. And this one point is, this point, what I, what, what I would say is the most, of what most of us don't even want to consider, what we don't even think about as in working in miracles, not because of weakness in believing God, uh, that God can perform miracles, but more like weakness in believing it for me and through me. That is the main cause for us not to even consider working in miracles. Because, well, we, we, we just don't know if all that is real. Isn't that right? Working in miracles. I look crazy. 
So let me challenge all of you this morning with what we believe in instead, or what we allow ourselves to believe in. In a moment, I want to share a video with you for you to consider this morning about faith, healing, and miracles. You see, this video is about a man by the name of Dwayne Miller. I first heard about this remarkable event from a Focus on the Family uh, radio cast I was listening to years and years ago. Dwayne was a pastor, you see, of a church. Somehow he, he got the flu, well, what he thought was the flu, and specifically, it wound up attacking his vocal cords. Now, you see, as a pastor and a preacher, that's a problem. That's a dilemma. That's a red butter. For the next three years, he goes to 63 specialists, over 200 doctors. He, he finally had to step down as a pastor, and he moved to Houston. He finally found another job and something else away from ministry. He became part of a very large Baptist church. One Sunday morning at that church, he had now become a member of, in the Sunday school he was a part of, he was asked to leave the study. The, the leader had to leave. And so to help him, remember, he has hardly any voice. They connect this mic to him, to amplify him. Now, from all the Sunday school classes, that was the only one that they would also have a recording of the lesson. It was a very popular class as things happen, so that if you miss a class, you can take one with you. What's interesting is that the lesson he was teaching was Psalm 103. The heading on Psalm 103 says, Praise for the Lord's mercy. Nothing really to do with miracles. Praise for the Lord's mercy. Remember, we don't want to deal with miracles because why? We just don't really know if that's true or not. And so anyway, he's teaching that God will and can still heal. Yes, he does that. But does, God doesn't have to heal all the time. See, I understand how that feels as a pastor. It's almost like building up false hope in people. Because people, they put so much on God instead of understanding that it comes back on us. And we'll see in a bit what it takes for miracles to happen. But first, I want you to look at this video and take notice of what happens. What's the name of the box that your faith is in? See, is your faith in a box called no faith? Jesus, he asked his disciples, why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? Is your faith in a box called little faith? In Matthew 14, 31, Jesus says, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Or is your, uh, your faith in a box called increase my faith? Increase it. For the disciples say to Jesus in Luke 17, 5, Lord, increase our faith. It sounds so good, doesn't it? See, the challenge with a miracle for the Lord to increase your faith, you're going to have to get uncomfortable. See, I think most of us, we, we camp out mostly every day in the little faith box. We have a little faith. See, when things get tough, when loved ones get sick, when, when, when the spouse acts up, when God doesn't come through, 
You know which box we go into? No faith. The no faith box. Isn't that right? Anyone else like me? Anyone else? Just me, huh? Okay, there's a couple of people. See, in order to move into that third box, where we ask God to increase our faith, listen to me, it starts with asking our, this of ourselves. You see, you have to ask this. You may want to write this down. Do I serve, listen to me, do I serve the God of the impossible? It doesn't really matter if you believe that or not. But you have to ask yourself, which God am I worshiping? Am I serving the God of the impossible? So, okay, maybe that's you. Maybe you want to be that person that moves from little or no faith. Maybe you, you want your faith to increase, and maybe this is the first time you hear this. That you can ask the Lord to increase your faith. How cool is that? Maybe your faith in an area of your life is very weak. Or you lost hope. Maybe you're losing hope in God altogether. Oh. A couple of things I want to give you today to understand that the Holy Spirit may be wanting to give you a gift of power in your faith, in healing, or performing a miracle, but your faith is not where it needs to be. Because listen, God is still God. He's still a God of miracles. You see, so what to know? Two things about gifts of power. First thing to know about yourself is that your obedience is expressed in actions. In actions. Right? We all say, especially the dudes, talk is cheap, baby. Come on. Your obedience is expressed in actions. And let me add this. Listen to me. Your obedience is expressed in actions and is a sign, listen to me, of your Christian maturity. That is, if you're still a baby, somebody needed to wipe your bottom. You see, action to what God is asking you to do is incredibly critical, and especially in these types of gifts that He wants to give you, of witnessing or being a part of. You see, listen to me, because this may be life-changing for someone, or this might help someone right now in understanding, listen to me very closely, this is a biblical truth, so listen up. Raise your hand if you're listening to me. Raise your hand. Good, okay. I got most of them. Because this is a big deal now. Some of you ain't going to like it, but that's okay. You see, you may be here and God is at his limit that you are letting him in your life. That is, you're only giving God so much and then it's done. Well, it's over. Lord, I am waiting and if you don't, you're at your limit with me, dude. You see, you wouldn't tell anyone but that's what you're feeling, right? Okay, listen. Faith. That's what we're talking about, right? Okay. Faith in God doesn't save us from. Did you hear what I just said? Faith in God doesn't save us from, but it is faith that saves us through. Say amen if you just heard me. Good. So our faith in God will save us through. Now this is big because this is where we get hung up, we get wasted away, and we give up on God, and we're talking about the supernatural. And yet, there you are. You're in a problem right now. Whatever, yet you might be going through. Someone might be sick in your life, okay? So what does that have to do with obedience, Pastor? Oh boy, here we go, listen up, I'm gonna start to preach. You see, we want God to save us from, when you know good and well, many times the reason where, where we're at is because of something we did or should have done, right? Let's be honest today. And so we pray stuff like when you're in the problem that you kind of created, Lord, help me. That again, I, I messed up. Or, or Lord, if you just make, you know, that bill go away or, you know, you just whatever. And then nothing, right? Crickets. But, you know, as I see in Scripture, God gives us and increases our faith in who he is and the healings, the miracles, and the power comes when we walk in obedience. That's the only way to whatever he is asking us to do. And oh, by the way, God will never contradict his word. So don't come up here with some kind of weird old biblical thing to me, okay? You get a lot of attitude from me. But anyway, take for instance Moses and Israel. In Exodus chapter 13, it says God didn't lead them to the promised land through the shortest route. Why? 
Because had they gone into the promised land, as weak and unbelieving as they were, does that sound familiar to anybody this morning? Am I preaching? But because of their weakness and unbelief, he leads them through the sea. The long run. What? Yeah, and listen, it wasn't that God saved them from, although he saved them from their own weaknesses. God didn't save them from, no, he saved them through, through the sea. Psalm 23, though I walk through the valley. You see, obedience goes through. They go through obediently with Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. Another example, quickly, Matthew 14, Peter, right, old Pete's walking on the water. Jesus didn't save the guys from the storm, but when they see Jesus, Peter says, tell me to come. How's that? E even going through that weakness, Peter asks the Lord, command me to go. And he does, and then Peter, right, he's human, he sees the seas roaring, right, kind of like what's going on in the Gulf Coast, and he starts to go under. In verse 30, he says, Lord, save me, and Jesus does. Isn't that cool? You see, to see your healing, to see your miracle, your obedience to what God is asking you to do is on you. What is he asking you to do? To repent? Well, great, you can repent all day. Action, blah, blah, move it. God is right there with an outstretched hand and the Spirit is waiting, waiting to empower you, gifts of power. Second thing you must understand is that you must be willing, oh, this is going to be big, some of not going to like that, that's okay. You must be willing to risk what you thought previously. See, to, to, to get your miracle, you must be willing to risk what you thought. Remember that guy on the video? Remember that pastor? Years, years. Hadn't preached anymore. Played it safe for years. Taught the same teaching. Didn't want to risk God's character, hallelujah, for that, right? He was playing it safe. Listen to me on this. I'm in no way preaching that God is our cosmic vending machine. Or that was, Pastor said to risk it, so God's got to come through. Heck no. Heck no. Look at 1 John 5, 14, if you think I thought that. Well, John says, this is the confidence that we have before him, that if, underline it, if we ask anything, circle according to his will, he hears us. You see, some of us, we ask what, whatever we want, and we leave out according to your will, Lord. Man, I'm going to tell you what, ask what you want, but if God ain't, Answering, it may be because you aren't asking or searching for his will. Now, if you've met with me, counsel with me on whatever, you know I usually ask this question every single time. Well, what is God asking you to do? What is he asking you to do? And many times it just kind of stops right there. The counseling. Well, I just haven't even gone into his will yet. Because you haven't even gone to God. You see, going to God is not just having a, a, a desire or emotion in you. It might start there. But that may be why you're stuck. And listen up, not risking what you think or what you thought. You know, thinking what we thought can't be wrong. You know, many of you know I'm a world-class cyclist. I'm a cyclist. <laughs> you know what we used to think as cyclists? We used to think that if you would smoke before or during a very long ride or tour, that it would open up your lungs. <clears throat> so what do I mean, risk what you thought? Maybe because you were brought up, maybe you were taught in a religious upbringing, maybe you're into science, like Nacho Libre, I'm into science. <laughs> Did you know that Jesus himself, he says that we're going to do greater things, greater works than he did? How is that possible? How could Jesus, God, say that we will have the ability to do greater miracles? Maybe he's just kind of being like a big cheerleader to us. You can do it. What a that boy. Is he lying? See, like in James chapter 4, he says, you have not, because you ask not. And in most instances, we don't even ask because we are unwilling to shame ourselves in asking. 
We're unwilling to lose our hope, because if I ask, he's already let me down. We're unwilling, plain and simple, we're unwilling to risk change. Isn't that right? Oh, no, Pastor, we like change. Okay, everybody stand up over here, cross over here, and you guys go over there. Why? You know why? It feels uncomfortable. Risk change. Right? If we say stuff like, I'll never do that. Well, that's a stupid thing the pastor said to do. That doesn't even make sense. You know what? We'll say, ah, I just don't want to. I'm good right here. Right here. Jesus loves me right here. What do I mean by risk? Check this out. Jesus said risk and see, but not risk in, uh, as in gamble. But look at John 14, verse 12 to 14 with me. Jesus says this, truly, truly. You know what that means? Orale, orale, like, for real, for real. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will also do, and greater works than these he will do, because I go to the Father. See, y'all didn't even catch that. Y'all asleep. You see, the Holy Spirit lives in you, ready. Jesus is right there with the death, ready. That's why you've got more power. Not just of who you are, because where he is and who's in you. Verse 13, whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You see, are you asking so that you can glorify yourself? So you can help yourself? Or that God get the glory? Okay, I'll preach you. Sorry. Verse 14. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. You see, God is still a God of miracles. God is wanting to increase our faith, is wanting to heal us, is wanting for us to experience miracles, but we need to walk in obedience. And we need to start risking what we thought. And that wasn't biblically true, is it? What we used to think. My son Dominique, when he was 13, he started going on mission trips. One time he goes to Thailand. I think it was your second time, right? Second time, so he was like 14 now. He was mature. I was on pins and needles. Anyway, they, they kind of had a free day from what I understand. I wasn't with them. And so him and his team, they start going and kind of killing time. And I guess one of them kind of says, you know what, maybe we should pray for some people, see what their needs are. Right? Debbie Downer. <laughs> Anyway, they go into this little shack, and there's this dude laid up in bed, like for over a year, right? Hadn't moved. He was being cared for by some family members. So this group of teens, they go in, they see the mean, and there's this guy, he's laid up, can't move. Well, they pray. They pray. They laid up. Couldn't walk. They had moved him to that little shack because he wasn't eating. He couldn't eat. He couldn't get up do nothing. So the dude gets up and he starts to walk around after they pray. What they thought wasn't what was true. But you see, they asked him, you still have pain? He says, yeah, but I'm walking. I'm too much pain, man. He says, no, man. So they prayed again. They prayed again. And boom, complete healing. But you see, I'll tell you, that was easy. That was easy. My son going to a third world country. But you see, my son, that boy, when he went to China, you see, the miracle started with me asking as he was laid up in the hospital when he was born. His little intestines were all twisted up. So my wife had emergency surgery. She's in one hospital. My son's in another one. I'm yelling and I'm screaming at God. I'm like, who do you think you are, man? I'm signing papers so that in case he dies, we don't sue him. Most of you see him when he plays the guitar on Sunday mornings. You see, that's my constant sign that I have a God of miracles today. He shared his life, and he got a miracle in Asia, but it started in a hospital. 
Robert, our head, head deacon years ago, I didn't know I was going to say this, had open heart surgery. I was crushed. What was I going to make fun of in the family? <laughs> I love him. Don't say anything bad about him because he'll get me upset. Had given him some medicine and he was bleeding out. He didn't know. It was a miracle that happened. You see, are you failing? Are you at the point of losing hope? You see, is your God a limitless, powerful God? What box is your faith in? S.M. Lutheridge from Calvary Baptist spoke back in 1976. I'm not going to use the full quote, but he says, The Bible says, My king, he's the king of righteousness. He's the king of the ages. He's the king of heaven. He's the king of glory. He's the king of kings, and he's the Lord of lords. That's my king. I wonder, do you know him? David said, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. My king is sovereign king. No means of measure can define his limitless love. No far-seeing telescope can bring into visibility the coastline of his shoreless supply. No barrier can hinder him from pouring out his blessings. His enduring, strong, and complete. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's impartially powerful. He's impartially merciful. Do you know him? He's the greatest phenomenon that ever crossed the horizon of this world. He's God's son. He's a, sin, he's a sinner savior. He's the centerpiece of civilization. He stands in the solitude of himself. He's awesome. He's unique. He's unparalleled. He's unprecedented. He's the loftiest idea in literature. He's the miracle of the age. He's the superlative of everything good that we choose to call in him and see in him. He's the only one qualified to be all-sufficient savior. I wonder, do you know him today? He supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the tempted and the tired. He sympathizes and he saves. He strengthens and sustains. He guards and he guides. He heals the sick. He forgives the sinners. He delivers captives. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He rewards the diligent. And his beauty beautifies the meek. I wonder, you know him? See, my king is the king. He's the king to knowledge. He's the wellspring of wisdom. He's the doorway of deliverance. He's the pathway of peace. He's the roadway of righteousness. He's the highway of holiness. He's the gateway to glory. Do you know him? Amen. See, his promise is true. His life is matchless. His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough. His grace is sufficient. His Rain is righteous and his yoke is easy and his burden is light. I wish I could describe him to you. He's indescribable. He's incomprehensible. He's invincible. He's irresistible. Well, you, you, you can't get him out of your mind and you can't get him off your head. You can't get him out of your life and you can't live without him. Death can't handle him and the grave couldn't hold him. Yeah, that's my king. That's my king. And the power and the glory forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. And how long is that? And when you get through all the forevers, then amen and amen. You see, that's the God of power that you have. Praise my King! Is your God the God of the impossible? I just told you, and I agree with that old pastor. That's my God. So how can you get to that place that you can believe and trust and obey and get the gifts of power? James 4, 6. He gets greater grace. Greater grace. Therefore it says God is opposed to the proud. Are you proud? Are you kicking against the power of Jesus? You can do it all day long, baby. He opposes the proud. But he gives grace to the humble. I'm going to ask Michelle to come up. I'm going to tell the band members, just tickle something. I don't usually do this, by the way. But I believe that God is still a God of miracles. 
as a pastor and a preacher and as your pastor for some of you, I truly believe that. I've seen miracles that will leave your mouth wide open and your lungs breathless. I truly have. I've seen marriages restored. I've seen the downtrodden pick back up. But some of you have lost complete and total hope in God, and I know we're running over time, and I apologize for that. Psalm 51 10 says, Create in me a clean heart, O God. To be truthful and honest, your heart isn't very clean, and that's why you haven't seen the miracle. You doubt. And that's cool. It's not true. And so I'm going to ask the prayer team to come up. They're going to be right over here. So if you need somebody to pray, you've lost hope and you need a miracle. If that's you, just come on up. We're here to pray with you and for you. Pray. If you want a guy to pray with you, Greg's going to come up and he's going to pray. We'll just take a little time and we'll close. Don't let this opportunity go. If you need a healing, Somebody in your family, come on up. Don't let this time pass.
going to continue to pray for some people up here. But I want you to know that we serve a God whose love is everlasting and whose power is limitless. When you come out of here today, you know that He loves you and that He has a plan and a purpose for your life. And that's the greatest gift we have in knowing who He is and that He walks with us. Have a blessed week. And if you need to come up here, Mr. Farrah, go ahead and come on up. We're going to continue to pray. God bless you. Have a great week.